Hello, and welcome to the Ask Historians digital conference session, Never Forgotten, Never Again, Recentering Narratives of Historical Violence. My name is Ryan Abt, and I'm the chair for this panel. Never Forgotten, Never Again explores the unearthing of violence in the past, and it deals with themes of the process of othering, the nature of perpetration of violence, and the methods and approaches to uncovering victim voices that have been deleted or are missing from the historical record. These themes will be explored in depth by our speakers during the session's roundtable discussion. Before we begin this session, however, we would like to acknowledge that the Ask Historians Digital Conference is taking place on the ancestral, unceded, and treaty territories of many indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. We offer our gratitude to these peoples and recognize that colonial nations continue to benefit from the brutality that enabled the original settler colonizers to seize these lands. The AHDC organizers acknowledge both the land upon which we are virtually hosting this conference and the deep-rooted and long-lasting harms caused by white imperialism and settler colonialism. We invite you to read our full land acknowledgement in our video description below. Our first speaker, Keely Cooper, is a second year PhD student at Rice University in Houston, Texas. She studies racial violence against African Americans in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. She will be presenting her paper, Dixie's Children, the Role of Youth in Scholarship on Postbellum Racial Violence. Thanks, Keely. My paper, Dixie's Children, The Role of Youth in Postbellum Racial Violence, was written upon the realization that studies of racial violence primarily focus on adult actors and victims. Secondary sources tend to omit children from historical retellings of racial violence, not because they were absent from these events, but I believe because there's a hesitancy to view children in particular as a gentle being who can be held accountable for the ways in which they absorb and act out the racist teachings they receive from their communities. This realization came from reading Raising Racist by Christina DeRocher, in addition to other historical works that, unlike this book, fail to adequately acknowledge the role of white and black children as instiga instigators, perpetrators, and finally as victims of racial violence. Historians who study racial violence, or more broadly, the civil rights movement, will be familiar with the lynching of 14-year-old Emmett Till, whose mother, after his death, allowed images of his corpse to be published in Jet Magazine. Shortly thereafter, Roy Wilkins, the head of the NAACP, stated that, quote, it would appear from this lynching that the state of Mississippi has decided to maintain white supremacy by murdering children. And I found the tone of this statement to portray that he expected shock and surprise from those who read it, as if the murder of black children was not something Americans were aware of. But primary sources indicate something different, at least among African Americans. The secondary sources that I consulted who used these sources state the same that Emmett Till's murder was not the first or only instance in which black children were sacrificed at Jim Crow's altar, and he certainly wouldn't be the last. He is only looked upon as one of white supremacy's youngest and most suffering victims because of his mother's actions. Till's death, I found, is used as an aberration, a physical example of the absolute worst of racial hatred. But the truth is, Till was only an exception in that his mother forced the world to, quote, see what they did to her boy. But there are so many more children that we don't talk about, and that's why historians use his death as an outlier and a false example of white supremacy gone too far. Emmett Till was just one of many children to suffer because of his race. And with that, I argue that by predominantly centering narratives of racial violence on Black adult victims and one 14-year-old boy, scholars falsely insinuate that white supremacists had some degree of humanity by not routinely going after children when that couldn't be farther from the truth. All of these children's stories deserve to be made part of the narrative. And my intention here is to highlight the sacrifices these children unintentionally made and make clear that Emmett Till was not an outlier, nor should his death alone be lauded as the principal example of white supremacy gone too far. In fact, this was the normalcy of white supremacy that was simply made public. I believe that black children other than Till are typically omitted from scholarship because these narratives may be too tragic a story to publicize to popular audiences, 
and scholars who don't study violence. I find it unlikely that few outside of the subfield would want to read an in-depth analysis on the torture and violent deaths of Black children whose experiences were used to sustain the Jim Crow system. A lack of appropriate scholarly attention may also stem from a silence in the archives. It's not lost upon me that the murder of a child was likely too traumatic for Black families to want to reiterate for the historical record. And as they grappled with this loss, they were also forced to deal with a myriad of other issues that came with existing as a nationally persecuted group. Even more upsetting is the reality that the murder of a Black child by whites was probably just as common as the lynching of a Black man or woman, thus not demanding of regional or national outrage. But these same circumstances surrounded the murder of Black adults and young adults. And who's to say that one suffering is any different from another's because of the age at which that victim was assaulted or killed? Paying attention to white children too, I make clear in this paper that children were not only capable of being made victims, but they could also be perpetrators and participants in racial violence. There are plenty of historians and sources that say children witnessed racial violence, but many historians other than Christina DeRocher and Jennifer Ritterhouse, author of Growing Up Jim Crow, don't analyze children past their being present at these events. And by not highlighting the roles of children, these historians feed into the invalid assumption that they were only spectators to violence. While true that some white children merely acted as spectators and received both formal and informal educations in how to uphold white supremacy, they also possessed a level of agency that allowed them to actively participate in violence against black people. They possessed an exercise agency because an education in whiteness informed them of their inalienable right and responsibility to involve themselves in activities that upheld the Jim Crow social racial hierarchy, which inherently included the use of violence. Critics may be hesitant to declare children completely agential beings because of the influence of their parents. But I assert that while white children did not possess the same level of agency as their adult parents, they had to possess a considerable amount of knowledge about themselves, supposedly inferior people, and the socio-racial system to act in the ways that the Jim Crow South demanded of its future protectors. The purpose of my paper is twofold, to highlight that many Black children other than Emmett Till became victims for far more benign reasons than an alleged whistle at a white woman. And second, that white children were more than capable of perpetrating or becoming actively involved in racial violence. In this paper, I reference a number of works that say that white boys castrated Black men and white girls lit corpses on fire. DeRosha writes in her last chapter that white adolescent girls were more likely to construct a myth of Black on white rape than white adult women. There's an instance in which a white boy lost a fight to a Black boy and out of wounded pride started a rumor saying that this Black boy said he's going to rape my sister. Another instance has a young white girl of no more than 10 pushing a Black girl off of the sidewalk and she says she did so because it was simply something to do, something she could do. And it was funny to other white spectators, including adults. In Ritterhouse's book, there's an instance of a three-year-old black boy being castrated by a grown man and thrown into a river. White teenagers are citing class aspirations and peer pressure as the main reasons they engage in violence. And of course, to impress girls that they like. But they note that when they start becoming more concerned with getting attention of white girls, one said, quote, our own acts took on a more specific edge of cruelty, and he called it an unthinking sadism. Such recollections and analyses are vital to our understanding of the ways in which white children internalize, help normalize, and exercise violence unthinkingly in their everyday interactions with African Americans. However, it appears that the authors of these statements attempted to mitigatingly qualify their actions by labeling them as unthinking, which warrants further study. It begs the question, can the exercise of racial violence possess some semblance of automaticity? In classifying such behavior as unthinking, this label certainly speaks to the centrality and normalcy of violence in the culture of white supremacy. But more problematically, it dispossesses white youths of blame and denies them the agency they were told they were entitled to as whites and that they believe that they possess. It also removes the responsibility that was made unequivocal in the claim that white boys willingly used violence to demonstrate their worthy belonging in socioeconomic classes or the attention from white girls. Even more chilling is what this routine access to violence did to these white children. It was constructed as a reward, 
in one instance, a white boy hadn't been behaving one day and as punishment, he had to stay home while the rest of the family went to a lynching. And another boy came back from a lynching rather disappointed and told his mother that he'd seen a man hanged and now he wished to see one burned. There's another instance in which a black boy out of a mob view saw another black boy being doused with gasoline and burned. So in this circumstance, while the boy in hiding is not being physically harmed, we cannot even begin to imagine what this experience has done to his mental state. And so while I've listed a host of examples in which white and black children are perpetrating or are becoming victims of deadly and non-deadly physical and mental violence, most of these stories are coming from two sources, Raising Racists by Christina DeRocher and Growing Up Jim Crow by Jennifer Ritterhouse. My bibliography lists close to 20 historical works and most of them only regard white children as audience members to lynching and or reference the murder of Emmett Till, which doesn't even begin to paint an accurate picture of the participants and victims of racial violence. And that here is the problem with this historiography. As I stated before, as someone who doesn't study racial violence to the extent that I or these other scholars do, it paints lynchers as people with some degree of humanity, right? If one was just to consider the lynchings of adults and Emmett Till as the exception, one could argue that J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant were the worst of all white supremacists because they went after a child when most lynchers didn't. So by this logic, lynchers who didn't assault or kill children had a modicum of restraint that stopped them from crossing that line. And that's an unacceptable and wholly inaccurate version of history that paints some lynchers as having more regard for Black life than others, which is not the case. And if scholars are dedicated to uncovering and disseminating the truth, no matter how uncomfortable, all perpetrators, no matter their age, need to be brought to light. And all of their victims, no matter how young, need to be acknowledged. Thank you. Keely, thank you so much for that eye-opening presentation. It certainly demands important discussion of the perpetuation of racism and its effects on our youngest members in society. Morgan Lewin is a student of the History Professorate at the Del Atuel Institute of Higher Education. They focus on the political influences of Romantic era composition styles, as well as the intersection between folkloric and native rhythms and the composition of Latin American art music. They will be presenting the paper, Grandpa Was Not a Terrorist, Re-Territorializing Union Activism During Argentina's Last Military Dictatorship. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everyone. Let us begin with the least original of phrases anyone could write regarding Argentina's contemporary and recent history. The history of the Argentinian 20th century is a torrid one. Ever since Hippolyto Yrigozhin's government was overthrown by a military coup on September 6, 1930, both democratic elections and legal due process were thwarted six times by subsequent military coup d'etats and dictatorships. This process of military interruption of the constitutional rule of law culminated in the most violent of them all, the self-appointed Proceso de Reorganización Nacional, or National Reorganization Process. During this dictatorship's tenure, which spanned the years between 1976 and 1983, the armed forces finished the process of establishing their own military doctrine based on French and American repression doctrines by enacting a series of violent repressive policies that became transversal to the governance of the entire country. The national constitution was declared null, effectively ending all constitutional guarantees and human rights. Political dissidence was labeled as subversive and dangerous and equated to terrorism. Union affiliation and university education in the humanities were often seen as similar to, or at the very least, a gateway to the aforementioned dissidence. In other words, unionism and the disciplinary fields of the humanities were considered to be breeding grounds for political dissent, boot camps for communist terrorist organizations. As a result, over 30,000 people were kidnapped, tortured, and summarily executed all over the country. We call them the disappeared. Around 500 of them were pregnant women whose children were taken from them after birth and sold to collaborationist families with close ties to the dictatorship's upper echelons. To this day, the mothers and the grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo, two nonprofit NGOs, continue to work towards the recovery of those children, now fully grown adults, so that they may learn of their original identities as the stolen children of the disappeared. 
These dictatorial actions were based on the incorporation of the French military doctrine on revolutionary warfare in 1957, following the 1955 coup that deposed Juan Domingo Perón. Said revolutionary warfare was characterized by the French doctrine as an undeclared war carried out by an internal enemy, which sought to destabilize any and all forms of order within the country in order to subvert it towards a Soviet-aligned communist regime. This doctrine prescribed measures such as the sectorization of the national territories into military controlled areas and the direct subordination of the security forces to the control of the armed forces. It also required the deployment of measures described as psychological actions and psychological warfare. The first one being the propagandistic actions aimed towards reinforcing both the fighting readiness of the armed forces and the collaboration of the general population. And the second one being the propagandistic actions aimed towards deterring and diminishing the fighting drive of the enemy forces, the aforementioned internal enemy. In the following two decades and, and starting particularly in 1961, the French doctrine was complemented with the assistance of the United States government through several legal instruments, such as the Alliance for Progress and the Foreign Assistance Act, a government program and a piece of legislation designed to provide loans and economic assistance to military dictatorships in Latin America, as well as through the School of the Americas, an institute dependent of the US State Department located in Panama. This institute was designed to train foreign military officers in jungle warfare and operation techniques for counterinsurgency operations against terrorist organizations. This complementation eventually led to a full replacement of the French doctrine by what Argentine scholars call the US national security doctrine, which enhanced the repressive techniques proposed by the French army with the addition of civic actions, the direct involvement and participation of the de facto government through public policies that helped reinforce the image of the armed forces as the protectors of the people. Policies that included subsidies for sports and healthcare areas, as well as intervention in regions affected by natural disasters, such as floods and earthquakes, through the giving away of food and supplies and the restoring of public services. The last dictatorship to rule Argentina was established according to this military doctrine after the coup d'etat that overthrew Maria Estela Martinez de Perón's government on March 24, 1976. On March 26, the offices of the Public Entertainment Workers Union's headquarters in the small town of San Rafael, Mendoza, were stormed by a group of commandos. While his wife and two children were beaten unconscious and their home ransacked, the union's local secretary general was kidnapped, as so many of his peers had been in those two days and would continue to be in the following years. He was taken to a police station and illegally held captive, beaten, starved, hooked to a metal bed frame and electrocuted. Like the over 30,000 disappeared, most of whom were unionists, university students, artists, and human rights activists. My grandfather, Antonio Campos, was accused of being a terrorist and a public menace, simply because he believed in and fought for his fellow workers' rights. He was one of the lucky few who were released instead of being executed. However, instead of taking the hint, he continued to run the union clandestinely, working towards a democratic future for Argentina, at the risk of being found out and disappeared permanently, even jeopardizing the safety of his family in the process during the remainder of the dictatorship. Through this case study, this paper will therefore aim to re-territorialize the role of non-governmental political participation, shifting the narrative proposed by Iran forces military doctrine regarding the labeling of said participation as terrorism and focusing instead on viewing it as activism the harsh reality behind the disappearances and the crimes against humanity committed during this period, which we've come to know as the state terrorism era, is that this wasn't, as the military doctrine dictated and as the media, both in Argentina and the rest of the world implied, a dirty war. The narrative of a war being fought by the brave armed and security force of Argentina was imposed as part of the aforementioned psychological actions aimed towards increasing the popular support and legitimacy of the military juntas by demonizing a specific portion of the population who were labeled as subversive terrorists. But how was this possible? Well, there had actually been paramilitary organizations during the previous decade affiliated to the proscribed Peronist movement that had acted within the confines of what is typically determined as terrorism, commonly defined by most international law instruments as acts of violence that target civilians in the pursuit of political or ideological aims through bombings, kidnappings, and summary executions of political figures, 
While there were several organizations that were active during the 60s and early 70s, including groups like Montoneros and the ERP, the People's Revolutionary Army, by the time the military had taken power again in 1976, these organizations had been reduced to almost nothingness. Their leaders forced into exile, their scattered cells barely clinging to life while in hiding. And so a new enemy had to be created. Unionists, university students, artists, anyone whose ideology or performance could be considered a threat against the status quo of both the military and their biggest supporters and collaborators, the upper classes, the land owning oligarchy of Argentina. My grandfather, who had been part of a political party called the Peronist Justicial Party for decades, and who had always been outspoken and publicly active regarding his beliefs, was taken like thousands of his peers after having been labeled as a subversive. He seldom talked about his own experiences, but he never stopped talking about those who had been there with him, those who hadn't been as fortunate as he was to be released. Even after the dictatorship was over, he continued to devote his life to union and human rights activism, in spite of the danger that had posed for his own safety and that of his own family. And yet, he was not alone in this pursuit. The over 30,000 people who were disappeared by the military tended to have very little in common. Different socioeconomic backgrounds, different religious and political affiliations, different ethnicities, and even ages. According to the tens of thousands of relatives and friends who have been interviewed by different organizations over the last four decades, the overwhelming majority of them did share something in common. They weren't terrorists. They were merely concerned citizens who saw the military juntas for what they were, fascist oligarchs who had no intention of thwarting a genuine communist or terrorist threat. They weren't terrorists. They were farmers, seamstresses, factory workers, university students and scholars of the humanities, social workers, union representatives. Some were taken because they had long hair or because someone had seen them reading Ernesto Guevara's motorcycle diaries or because they were Jewish. Some 700 people were disappeared simply because they were queer. Their memories lives on in the people they loved, the people they touched, and in those of us who have the privilege and the responsibility to write about them. And so it is my duty to remind our audience of one simple fact. There was no such thing as a dirty war in Argentina. Because a war requires combatants on both sides. There are two maxims in the Argentinian human rights movement. The first of them is memoria, verdad y justicia. Remembrance, truth, and justice. The second one is the one I'm going to close with. Nunca más, never again. Thank you. Morgan, I appreciate this presentation. It is helpful to remind us that labels matter and that we must resist the false narratives that normalize or affirm state violence. For our next presentation, Sean Rems uh, will be speaking to us. He is an MA student in the Department of Religions and Cultures at Concordia University. He previously completed an MA in history at the same university. His earlier work focused on ethnicity and class with bystander responses to the Holocaust in Hungary, while his current research is on the migration to Montreal of Hungarian Holocaust survivors and refugees of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. Today, he will present his paper entitled The Portrayal of Roma by Jewish Survivors of the Holocaust in Hungary. Thank you, Sean. I would like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University, the university I attend, is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Ganyan Kehaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which my university and I are situated. Jage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous, and other peoples within the Montreal community. In this conference paper, I intend to provide a Hungarian case study for Ari uh, Joskowicz's article, Separate Suffering, Shared Archives, Jewish and Romani Histories of Nazi Persecution. This article is about the invocation of the Judeocide and the Roma genocide that both constitute the Holocaust, focusing on the way in which research on the latter must be conducted through archival sources based on the former. It is a rather unique instance of subaltern history in which the narratives of an epistemically silenced group, the Roma, often need to be accessed from another marginalized group, which has faced a similar degree of violence in key junctures of European history, but has had quite a different ebb and flow of national identification and assimilation. Joskowitz examines Jewish perceptions of Roma and vice versa 
mainly in extremists, primarily in the Warsaw, Siedlice, and Lodz ghettos, the latter including over 5,000 Roma reported from Hungarian-speaking Burgenland in Austria. Joskowitz stresses the contingent power relations between Jews and Roma in the Holocaust, emphasizing the entanglement of distinct oppressions faced by each group, and how the threading of Roma accounts in testimonies of Jewish survivors has implications not only for research, but also for the politics of memory. Joskowitz states that Jews tended to live at an effective distance from Roma throughout Europe, which is true in the Hungarian case as well. But Holocaust survivors from Hungary and its borderlands address how the social gap between these groups oscillated in everyday experience during the interwar period. In a wide ranging set of Holocaust memoirs, which have been important for many aspects of my research, Jewish survivors narrate in different registers, which can help historians parse out different aspects of Roma life. George Reinitz in his memoir, Wrestling with Life, and Hermann Grunewald in his memoir, After Auschwitz, from Sixo and Rohood respectively, both in Northeastern Trian on Hungary, describe Roma living conditions in what can be construed as an ethnographic style. Both attest to the diversity of trades and odd jobs in which they were competent, and that they lived in mud houses on the opposite side of the Monta Creek uh, near Sixo, at the edge of Rohod, respectively. Their formal segregation and social distance from both Christian and Jewish Hungarians were a legacy of the policies of the Austro-Hungarian Empire from 1867 to 1918, since Roma were forced to remain nomadic and segregated, irrespective of their patriotism or communal identifications. Whereas it was Hungarian policy for there to be an economic symbiosis between Jews and the Hungarian state, thereby leaving their path wide open for assimilation and Hungarian national identification for 50 years. While the epistemic and physical violence inflicted on both peoples in the Holocaust era was perpetrated by a new state with a profoundly different attitude of migrant Christian ethno-national purity, the valence or symbolic meaning ascribed to the violence seems to have varied between Jewish and Roma victims. While being a betrayal in the case of Hungarian identifying Jews, probably the greatest betrayal by a host nation in modern history, it was an intensification of the victimization uh, of the Roma. So it was more continuous uh, for them. In the historiography of parallel victimhood between Hungarian Jews and Roma, I thus emphasize the similar scale of colossal violence perpetrated against them, both on Hungarian soil and in Auschwitz-Birkenau, but stress that the effective or emotional reception may have often been different. Jews being racialized and targeted in a shockingly fast blitzkrieg, i.e. in the spring and early summer of 1944, and the Roma being attacked in a more continuous and slightly less urgent way, and also later on um, in, in 1944. Eva Fahidi, having a particularly detailed memory of growing up in the hinterland of Debrecen, and a poignant recollection of Auschwitz-Birkenau, also writes in a hybrid ethnographic and anecdotal style. She also describes her family's sense of sympathy and generosity towards the local Roma, remarking on her grandmother's conflation of Roma and visibly observant Jews as other. Ahidi indicates that her family did not take this othering for granted, asking them why they wouldn't assimilate. From this, we see a profound inequality of opportunity to assimilate and develop roots in a given Hungarian place, but this was understood as historically contingent, and not a timeless essence of a group identity. In several Hungarian or borderland Holocaust survivor memoirs I've encountered, references to Rama are centered on the economic or occupational symbiosis within the memoirist's community or family. Albert Holm, in his memoir, My Handwriting Saved Me, gives a perspective from quote unquote, underdeveloped easternmost Subcarpathia to which Czechs were not native, the Eastern province of the first Czechoslovak Republic that was re-annexed by Irredentist Hungary in March of 1939. He provides a firsthand account of their seasonal migration to his hometown of Tornatiza, not explaining these nomadic ways in terms of erstwhile Habsburg policy, but rather through their quote unquote, happy disposition and free and easy lifestyle, quote unquote. Of particular note is his observation of the trade relations between the carpathian ruthenian locals and Roma metal workers. Holm explains this through the curiosity of these indigenous Ruthenians, to which I would add that as a minority subject to the whims of larger nations, they had empathy with Roma that majoritarian peoples such as Czechs, Hungarians, and Romanians were less likely to have. Gloria Hollander Leon's memoir, Mommy, What's That Number on Your Arm? reads like a microethnographic account. In her observation of minute detail, and perspectives from different family members. Like Albert Holm of Tornatiza, Hollander's recounting of the Roma of her hometown of Nagbreg or Beregi is understood in terms of seasonality. Roma came to the town during the Jewish festival of Sukkot in the autumn. They brought baskets and Jews gave them their harvest, fitting in with the theme of the festival. Gloria made friends with a Roma girl, Razi. In Michael Mason's A Name Unbroken, he tells a reader that one of his teachers in the border town of Shataralia Uhei emphasized silk making as both lucrative and patriotic, and he thus set up a silk making business in which he hired Roma children to pick the mulberry leaves. This is an example of Jewish youth entrepreneurship that created a symbiosis between Jews and Roma on the micro level. 
In the multivocal memoir, We Never Lost Hope, Singapore Holocaust survivor, Edith Festinger Litvin, observed that her father let a large Roma family stay in their backyard in Satumara, also in Northwestern Romania for a summer. She was interested in their brick making and appreciated their competence and local economic roles. Earlier at the Festinger family's Tisa Hotel in Siget, their doorman was a Romani named Odin, who played an important role in advertising the hotel, purchasing its groceries, and in the memories of Edith more generally. The educational outcomes of the successor regimes of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy also show divergences between Jewish and Roma relationships with the state and majority populations. The fact that Subcarpathian Jews went to Czech schools gave them opportunities in the first Czechoslovak Republic, but also caused substantial resentment among the Ruthenian majority. Albert Holm remarks on the reticence of Roma to go along with the Czech quote unquote civilizing mission of assimilation through education as well as some healthcare provisions. This reticence can be attributed to the lingering mistrust that Roma had of Habsburg policy, which is reflected in the liberal democratic yet sometimes condescending ethos of the first Czechoslovak Republic. Penning Edge scholarship addresses this. In Rasegal's Genocide in the Carpathians, he notes both stability and upheaval in the lives of Roma in interwar Czechoslovakia, and that state authorities did very little to help the Roma uh, with formal education on their own terms, for example, in Ujerod in northwestern Subcarpathia. As of 1927, Roma were subject to surveillance in probably more invasive ways than minorities that could actually be construed as potentially geopolitically dangerous, such as Germans and Magyars and they were legally required to hold special licenses if nomadic. Eva Fahidi indicates that in Erdesmechke in Barania County in Southern Trinan, Hungary, an experienced school teacher did provide opportunities for Hungarian literacy for the Roma, which had a meaningful outcome because it was up to each person to accept. There was no state coercion behind it. This is later in the communist era, but it reflects that the apparent Roma aversion to formal education in the language of the majority is really about the mistrust of majoritarian Eastern European states. One of the key victim groups in the Holocaust that attested most forcefully to the horrors perpetrated on the Roma, the quote unquote gypsy family camp of Auschwitz, are Hungarian Jewish women who were deported in the spring and early summer of 1944. In my collection of memoirs, I know it was particularly that Jewish woman from Greater Debrecen in Eastern Trinan, Hungary, Eva Fahidi in The Soul of Things, Judy Weissenberg Cohen in A Cry in Unison, and Magdu Stone in Resilience. They narrate their recollections of the liquidation of the quote unquote gypsy camp on August 2nd of 1944, emphasizing the singularity of the Roma suffering. Joskowitz shows in the case of uh, Belgian restitution, the Goldstein Commission, that Roma strategies for public memory of the Faraginus have been implicitly structured on the model of archives and, and advocacy of Jewish victims. This feeds into his larger argument about Roma Holocaust memory so often being accessed to meet its Jewish counterpart. In Ben and Gary Younger's memoir, The Last Train to Auschwitz, we see this taking place on a micro level. In their 1995 trip to Ben's hometown of Sapinza in the northwestern Romanian borderland of southern Maramures, annexed by Hungary from 1940 to 1944, they visited the local Rome Baro, who was effusive in his hospitality and wanted them to take many pictures. They realized that underlying this was the Roma leader's desire to have their history recorded for posterity and for it to be spread diasporically. Their survival of the Faragimos and their successful sedentarization, which was seen by the community as progress. We thus see how Jewish Holocaust survivors have been entrusted with Roma memory, especially salience given that Roma, especially in Hungary and neighboring states, face all kinds of violence, epistemic, physical, and so on, and hostility. All the more so with the Fidesz government of the past decade, the global rise of right-wing xenophobic movements, and the increased power of police during the current pandemic. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Sean. Your, your work truly helps illuminate the different ways that othering and oppression can occur swiftly or, or slowly. And we can see how victims of violence can and often do support and give voice to one another as well. So thank you for that. Next, we're going to go into a period of uh, questions, uh, a period of discussion where uh, all the panelists will be able to talk about each other's different papers and also ask questions of one another. I'm going to get us going uh, with the question that, that I have. It seems like in all of these cases, uh, it's difficult to know exactly where state action uh, occurs and where the actions of various groups or individuals in society begin and when they end. Uh, where is it collaboration with the state? Where is it state action? Do you see that? What do you make of it? And, and what were some similarities you saw in those interactions between other papers or questions you had for one another? Regarding the Holocaust in Hungary, 
Although the genocidal process was a state-led affair to a greater extent than in places such as fascist Croatia, the quote-unquote independent state of Croatia, and some parts of Eastern Europe, it is true that ordinary ethnic Magyars were implicated in the genocides of Jews and Roma, but the degree varied considerably based on social position, class. Plunder and the lower middle class populist policies of certain fascist and ultranationalist Hungarian politicians were primary factors here. For example, the interior minister of 1944, Andrei Jarosz's uh, idea of social welfare through plunder. Another main factor was that of propaganda. Although the full force of state violence did not come down to bear on Jews and Roma until 1944, the previous non-Nazified aristocratic government allowed for vicious propaganda against Jews and Roma to be explicit by opposition politicians, press, and on the radio. The state authorities in 20th century Hungary, often on the regional and municipal level, were frequently inclined to raid Roma communities and put them under surveillance, all the more so during the years of World War II and in the regions under administration by fanatically anti-Roma figures such as Laszlo Endre. And among peasants and villagers, while the industrial and modern era had reduced the extent of the symbiotic relationship between them and Roma, the popular music and cinematic culture revealed that there was still a peaceful coexistence between Roma and ordinary Hungarians that was generally not legible to state authorities. And while the Hungarian state, and especially its gendarmerie, stopped making distinctions between sedentary and traveling Roma as of 1938, memoirs of Holocaust survivors suggest that civilians still did. I think I can also address that question. Um, definitely Sean's answer just now kind of gave me um, a, a bit more enlightenment about, you know, how state actors um, and individual citizens, <clears throat> excuse me, can, you know, have their hand in persecuting uh, marginalized groups. But I also saw um, a relationship to Morgan's paper, too, um, regarding how, how the state can write, like in, in Sean's paper, surveil, you know, surveil certain groups that they don't trust. Um, I think there is definitely some overlap between all of our papers in, in you know, the state operating with certain um, groups, certain private citizen groups um, in order to persecute people. Like, like for example, in, in my paper, while I don't see, I don't, I don't see see in my studies how the state is targeting, um, you know, young black children um, through violence, except for, you know, those images that we see out of Birmingham, Alabama, where we have um, like sheriff's office or police departments targeting young children with fire hoses and dogs. So that's one part of it, but we, we can also see, as I stated, right, with the Emmett Till case, how there are private citizens going after, um, you know, certain individuals or certain groups that they, you know, feel the need to attack and put in their place. And with this Emmett Till case, there is some help from um, local and state, local, state, and federal authorities who aren't going after people who commit racial violence against people of marginalized groups. So in this way, we can definitely see how um, even if in fact that there is no premeditated um, organization between private citizens and the government, we can eventually see how, how that relationship, how those relationships help these groups because the federal government or the state government is not going after people who are committing violence. So in that way, they are helping each other and protecting one another. Um, but it's still, you know, in the beginning, they are separate entities who are trying to um, disenfranchise, keep, you know, marginalized populations down, and then they eventually come together to help one another out. So personally, I think that, um... It, it, it's interesting because there is there's certainly a lot of overlap between our papers and at the same time I study something that tends to be very different because especially when it comes to to Anchilis paper because I study the opposite I actually study I study more uh, everything that I research is more about the state than it is about citizenry but it is very interesting that at least in Argentina's case because we have come to establish a very clear definition and a very clear separation between the concept of perpetration and the concept of collaboration here in Argentina. 
because the during the state terrorism period uh, between 1976 and 83, there is no such thing as a crime against humanity committed by a regular citizen. That doesn't happen. There, there is no such thing as a hate crime committed by a regular citizen because every single citizen of Argentina was under martial law. Uh, it's not like the, the state didn't uh, separate the population. The state did grant certain guarantees and certain rights to the upper classes who collaborated with them financially, uh, particularly the landowning oligarchy and the industrialist section of the bourgeoisie. Uh, but generally speaking, our population was essentially always in danger. The vast majority of the population was always at any point in danger of being taken by the military just because, well, for anything. That, that's why I was mentioning something as easy and as just as, as everyday thing these days as having long hair. Uh, myself, personally, not having all that much hair, I would have probably been taken by the military. Um, I would have I would have been thinking about the military for many things though. Uh, historians had a very difficult time during this particular period. Most uh, recognizable names in Argentinian historiography had to exile themselves. Um, but I do think it is important to to find this this sort of correlation between collaborationism, because in Argentina's case, um, and it was the case in most of Latin America again. These changes in this application of what we call the U.S. national security doctrine, uh, it, it wasn't just in Argentina. The School of the Americas uh, trained over 60,000 military officers from all over Latin America. It trained most dictators. Uh, it, the, the Augusto Pinochet was trained in, uh, in the School of the Americas. Jorge Rafael Videla, one of our main dictators, was also trained there. Uh, and this idea, this concept of applying these this psychological actions, this, this concept of, of civic action, of trying to gain legitimacy by appearing, by the military showing themselves and portraying themselves in, in the media, uh, in pamphlets, in street signs, as the protectors of the people, as the protectors against this enemy, this very, very specific and very scary enemy, uh, ended up creating a sense of collaboration either by active participation in which people would go and just call the police on their neighbors, on their friends, just because they suspected them of any sort of subversive activity, um, or just by turning a blind eye. Uh, when my grandfather was taken by, by the military, uh, my grandma, my grandmother, and my mother remembered that they tried to they tried to get the attention of their neighbors. It was late at night, and it was very noisy. I mean, that they, they stormed their house, they destroyed most of it. it. It was chaos all around the neighborhood, and nobody opened their door. Nobody opened the, the, the every every shutter was closed in every single house down the street. Um, so I think that it's it's an important element to to keep in mind, even though I study primarily the role that the state played in perpetrating these acts of crimes against humanity. I do agree and I do believe that there is a, a, a very important correlation with the collaboration of everyday citizens who either actively uh, sold their neighbors and their friends out or did nothing at all to prevent what was going on. Margaret, I have a follow-up question. Um, you talked about how neighbors and friends or people would report their neighbors and friends. I'm wondering why you think that that was um, the case because right, it could possibly mean that you know these reporters were trying to show that they were pro-state, that they supported what the state was doing, or do you think that they did so because they were trying to right, just protect themselves from, you know, being seen as an adversary of the state? Why do you think that was occurring? Uh, that, that's a great question. I and mean, that's a question that it's, that's been asked by many historians uh, who study this particular period, because I personally, my research has shown me that there is a little bit of both. Um, when, you, when, you, when we think about the, the, the Red Scare in general, uh, like the first one or the second one, we usually just think about the United States 
as the main focus of of this fear of communism of this 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 terror of of uh, everything turning into communism. But in reality, the School of the Americas and the Foreign Assistance Act were designed to spread this fear, not only to uh, the dictatorships that ruled Latin America during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but also so those dictatorships could instill that fear in their populations. So people were terrified of communism. Uh, Argentina is a very peculiar case because Ernesto Guevara El Che was Argentinian. He was born here. Uh, he was one of the most important figures in the 1959 revolution in Cuba, which ended up creating this, these programs, uh, which were initially enacted by, by Kennedy during Kennedy's presidency. Uh, because, well, everyone was afraid that communism was coming. It had effectively showed up and it had effectively established itself as the norm in Cuba. Cuba was very close to the US and Cuba was very close to everywhere else. So people were very afraid and people were scared. People were scared of the terrorist acts that had been committed during the early 70s and late 60s, um, which weren't communist uh, <laughs> attacks. The, the, these organizations were usually right-wing. These terrorist organizations that were active in this period were usually just either center or center right-wing, but people is still associated with, with communism. But I think that there was also a certain a sense of fear and a, and a sense of, because people were really afraid to go outside. There was a curfew during six years in, during this dictatorship in which people couldn't go outside after 8 p.m. Uh, people were terrified of the police because the police were the armed forces. It was the same thing at this, at this period because they were directly subordinated to the armed forces. So people were definitely terrified. People didn't know what to do. And many people seem to have believed that uh, turning people over to the police and the military would sort of grant them a certain level of clemency, that it would uh, make the, the military look at them in a, in, a, in a nice light, which wasn't really the case. The military didn't really care. The mili the, 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 it's not like the military were giving out awards or money to people who, who handed people over. No, because it was expected of the population. Uh, but yeah, long story short, I, I believe it's it's a little bit of both. I think that's a that's a great question, and Keely, it, it actually makes me very interested because um, both you and Sean have a different kind of situation where the the victimized groups uh, it, it wasn't the entire population which was at the threat of of being victimized. The the groups uh, that that acts of violence were perpetrated upon. Uh, in your cases. Uh, were already stigmatized, they uh, were separated from the population in, in other ways that uh, perhaps they couldn't hide or they couldn't uh, get away from that. So what do you, what based on uh, what Morgan just discussed, how do you see that playing out differently because of those differences or, or did you see it playing out differently? Yeah, the, 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 the question of the, the process of separation of Jews and, and Roma and how the Hungarian government came to that. Um, so the 1928 decree by Hungarian uh, interior minister, uh, Bela Szkitowski, marked the beginning of systematic efforts to find traveling Roma. Thus, the beginning of the Hungarian state sustained push to categorize Roma and surveil them. Around the time of this decree came legislation which uh, sought to take away livelihood of itinerant artisan Roma preventing them from offering uh, crafts making services to Hungarians and thus separating them from the majority population. And surveillance was especially in vogue in legislation starting in the latter 1920s in Central Europe, affecting Roma not only in Hungary, but also Bavaria and the first Czechoslovak Republic. And the chief ma magistrate of Gudule at that time, Laszlo Andre, wrote proposals encouraging the segregation of the Roma populace. And the anti-Roma and anti-Semitic pronouncements of Laszlo Andre did have significant local effects vis-a-vis uh, -vis blocking the interaction of Roma and Jews with ethnic Magyars, tightening uh, the visor of segregation during World War II and taking full effect on a nationwide level with the ghettoization of 1944. Um, and the Roma were considered quintessentially other throughout much of Europe. And in Hungary, this uh, frequently uh, violent othering continues until this day. And in one of Laszlo Andres' proposals of 1934, he wrote that the quality of Hungary's public health and image abroad were being sullied by the Roma. And this kind of thinking was used to justify the biannual raids by the gendarmerie of that era. And these raids intensified in World War II, 
and authorities subjected them, subjected them to a curfew and withheld food rations. And uh, the eminent historian Rasegel emphasizes that authorities saw the Roma question as equally imperative to the Jewish question, linking edicts against both groups. And accumulated and systematized prejudices of the gendarmerie and others led them to believe that Roma were inherently foreign and diseased, no matter the reality on the ground. Um, so that Roma were already very much uh, you know, separated from like, the body politic and, and were already othered for, for so long. Um, and so it was definitely the sense that um, ethnic Magyars, the, the majority population, could easily turn against them. That, um, and it, it was said also in, um, in, in trials and investigations after the war, like at the, at the, the trial of Adolf Eichmann, for example, he said that um, no one, you observed uh, on the ground, no one had sympathy uh, for, for, for the Rama, like in, in terms of the, the Hungarian and German populations and, and any of the civil service they interacted with. And this is something that was you know, observed from, uh, from, from many sides. Now, from, from the, the perspective of Jews who are also persecuted, you know, there we have like a very interesting complex picture in terms of how um, they, there, were, there was a distance from them in terms of how they, were, how they were given the opportunity to assimilate or not. But we were able to see through Holocaust memoirs, um, you know, just the sense of how Roma did interact with the majority population, and then were separated uh, uh, from it. And, and, and so while um, I, I don't really address uh, Roma testimonies um, in, directly in my work, uh, I do um, build on some secondary sources. So for example, like there's been a, there has been a lot of research done on, on the anti-Roma legislation um, and on, you know, you know, many aspects of, uh, of the testimony and, um, and, and, and various regional studies. So in this book, for example, Farajumos uh, um, by Janos um, Barshon and Agnes Tarotzi, um, uh, it's uh, a very instructive uh, in that regard. Um, but I really wanna emphasize that, you know, just how marginalized the Rama were and still are. So it was a very, very much, uh, um, such a long-term um, marginalization, and that even after the Roma Holocaust, um, it was very hard for them to get any kind of recognition. It took decades until like the 70s before there was any, um, any like recognition from, from the state, from Germany and Hungary uh, on a substantial uh, basis. And uh, as the Joshkowitz article uh, shows, um, you know, the Rome often, um, Roma testimony and, and um, you know, attempts of um, memory work had to be done through Jewish archives and through, uh, through the Goldstein Commission, for example, in which, um, you know, Jewish victims were, um, the interviewers asked them specifically about Roma they had, they had encountered. And, uh, um, and, and specifically, like, they went off script to, to address uh, the Roma. So, you know, after the war, like, the, just the way the Roma, the, the memory, the politics of memory and the remembering of the Roma genocide, you know, took place with, with the help of, you know, Jewish institutional efforts and, you know, uh, and through, you know, the, um, the numbers of various interviewees. And, um, and just, there's also the fact that this is reaching its apex, this persecution of Roma and Jews in Hungary at the end of the war in 1944. And, um, like Laszlo Endre and, and, um, and the Interior Ministry of Hungary focused on the Jews mainly first. And then as soon as the, the provincial Jews and borderland Jews were deported, they, they turned to uh, persecuting the Roma. And then after the Arrow Cross coup of October uh, 15th, um, in which you know, the constitutional order of uh, Hungary was, was beginning to break down, but there was still, um, the state framework, then there was, you know, particularly like vicious, um, you know, home, homegrown attempt of uh, a persecution of Rama through the, the Arrow Cross regime, and, uh, um, and also um, persecution on, and also in, in certain regions in particular, such as once Romania left the war, um, uh, or defected to, to the allies in late August of 1944, 
Hungary and Nazi Germany were invading um, in parts of Transylvania, um, you know, because you know, they breaking the, the previous agreement that they had at the partition of Transylvania. And, you know, one of their first priorities was to attack uh, Roma and, and Jews there. And also in Transdanubia, um, which is the Western part of Hungary, they were, uh, um, you know, Arrow Cross and Gendarmerie were very focused on um, inter interning the Roma and uh, um, massacring them, the Varpolota massacre, for example. And um, so there, there, there is that temporality in terms of 1944 itself. And then once there's a siege of Budapest and the Soviet and Romanian armies really make a lot of um, you know, progress on their war front, um, you know, then, uh, then the majority population of Hungary does really um, start to feel the pressure of the war in, in, in a way it did not before. Um, so ethnic Magyars were in a sense sheltered until, to an extent, um, I mean, the civilian population uh, of, the, of the majority ethnic Magyars until, you know, quite late until uh, 1944. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as the front moved westward, you know, the majority population was more affected. And then by once, once the Soviets uh, impose their rule, then there is like backlash against the uh, Hungarians and, and German minorities and population exchanges between, you know, the reconstituted Czechoslovakia and Hungary. So while I am emphasizing um, the genocidal violence against the minority population of Roma and Jews, um, there was, there ended up being suffering for everyone um, you know, as the war reached its conclusion. Um, so, and, and there was also the breakdown or fragmentation of, of state uh, authority. Um, so there is this more complex picture and uh, scholars like Raz Segal have addressed that in, in their work, um, you know, Genocide in the Carpathians, where he really emphasizes the, the, the multiple layers of violence, um, you know, throughout, I mean, before the war and, and throughout the war that, um, you know, we're focused on Jews and Roma and also to a lesser extent, carpatho Ruthenians. And then um, as the war was ending, it affected everyone. Thank you. So one, one thing that uh, Sean pointed towards, and I think that uh, Keila and, and Morgan can address here is that um, the, the people that you were speaking about were separated in some ways, ideologically, racially, ethnically from the rest of the populace. Um, but at, at the same time, um, that separation then uh, was used to increasingly separate them or even demonize them. So the image of otherness that these, that these victims uh, had, that these victims of violence had, um, was, was created and they were punished based on it. And then that punishment further othered them. Am, am I right in seeing that perhaps or something similar or, or not at all? Uh, maybe Nkili and Morgan uh, can, can follow uh, what Sean's given us on that and, and, and make some comments on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, speaking to the, the separateness, I mean, especially in the Jim Crow South when we're talking about white and black, I mean, there are a number of examples that I can list from redlining uh, neighborhoods to, um, you know, the segregation of schools, churches, places of business. Um, we can go on and on about this. And I think, you know, regarding the surveillance that we were talking about in the last question, um, especially if an African-American person wanted to test the system um, and, you know, see what they could get away with by entering um, an all-white uh, restaurant or by desegregating a school, whatever it may be, um, you know, when they were punished, um, you know, through violence by one person or, you know, a group of people who just you know, were completely gobsmacked at, you know, their, um, the fact that they felt entitled to do this, to desegregate something, um, when they experienced that violence, um, you know, that violence could be physical, bodily violence, or it could be um, against their home, right? And so when a person's home was 
for example, firebombed like Martin Luther King Jr. or, Mar or Malcolm X, um, or just a private citizen whose name that we don't, you know, routinely hear in the history books. That alone, that evidence um, of their house being firebombed, that you know, said to the white community that, oh well, you know, their house was firebombed. They did something to deserve this, not only because they were black, but because they also tried to test this system. Um, and this is what happens when you test that system. So, um, not only was it surveillance, um, you know, in the moment when they tested that system, whenever they tried to, to desegregate a school or sit at an all white lunch counter, not only were they attacked then, but then their home and their property was attacked. And, you know, if they were a poor, you know, black southerner who relied on credit to feed their families, um, you know, the, the store owner would not give them, would, would would not give them, you know, a further larger line of credit um, because then, because first they knew, you know, what this person had done to this Jim Crow system. Um, and, you know, possibly if that store owner um, agreed to give them a further line of credit, for example, then that store owner um, would be punished by his community by, you know, uh, being sympathetic to a black person who tried to test this system. Um, so in that way, the, the surveillance just does, it does not end at the point where that person tried to shake up um, the Jim Crow South social racial system. It extended to their families, um, their communities, I know in one instance, um, this, this comes out of the kissing case in Monroe, North Carolina in 1958. There was an instance where a white girl, a young white girl, maybe like six or seven years old, she kissed a black boy on the cheek. And when this black boy was arrested while he was put away in a juvenile uh, detention center, um, the rest of his family, his mother, his sisters, while they were living away at home, um, not only had shots been fired into their home, but their dog had been killed, right? So it's not just about that one person, it's about every person um, associated with that person who has made this great transgression against the system. So um, the, right, the surveillance doesn't stop at that one person, it is community-wide. Um, and I think that's really important um, to, to recognize that the, all of these connections um, within our papers. Personally, I think that in, when it comes to my paper, um, there is certainly an important element of, uh, of a certain segregation of these people who were targeted by the military. But it's not a segregation that comes from the same place as, uh, as the other two papers, because it's not an inherently racially motivated segregation or ethnically motivated segregation, only probably residually racially motivated uh, because Argentina has a very large brown population. Uh, around 54% of us have native origins. Uh, some of them are, are as brown as I am. Other people are considerably more brown than I am. Uh, we have a very large uh, uh, black population as well. The Afro-Argentine population is also a very important uh, number in our statistics, but the, the military were more concerned with this concept of uh, the concept that, that became very much installed in the general population, which is the idea of algo habrán hecho. They must have done something. Um, they must have done something to deserve this. It, it may just be the fact that they were born Jewish. It may just be the fact that they were queer. Uh, it may just be the fact that, again, someone saw them reading something they shouldn't have been reading. Someone uh, saw them listening to an artist that was banned by the, by the military censorship. Um, there, was a, there were a multitude of reasons why people could be targeted. Uh, but there was no, again, the, the fact that the entirety of Argentina was under the control of the military and that it wasn't... Uh, uh, localized to regionalized segregation is definitely a key element at play when it comes to understanding how people were uh, taken. People were taken because of what they affiliated with. People were taken because they had been part, they, they had studied uh, psychology or they had studied history. During this period, the military closed most of the, of the colleges pertaining to the humanities. 
the military outright closed most national uh, psychology colleges, history colleges, philosophy colleges, sociology, every single uh, humanity that wasn't, well, economy, which <laughs> it's, it's hardly surprising because they needed economists, um, they, they, they just disappeared. And many of the people who were involved in student organizations or who have been professors who had been known to have either socialist or Peronist or even communist affiliations at some point in their lives were targeted. Um, exile was certainly an option for many people who were able to pay for it. Uh, but the vast majority of the 30,000 people who were disappeared didn't have the means because again, most of these people were just unionists or just random people that, that some military officer or some police officer didn't actually like and they just took them because they could. Uh, so it, th I think that in, in, at least when it comes to my particular paper, um, I tend to look at this more from the perspective of, of segregating people out of sheer hatred for what they stand for than from what they are. Because the military didn't, didn't really care about who these people actually were. Uh, they just care that they they may look like they like they, they were subversive or like they were dangerous in any in any way, which again is something that is very uh, just just to rub up. Uh, Argentina has always been very strict when it comes to owning weaponry. You can't just buy a weapon here in Argentina. It's very difficult to actually have any sort of, of firearm. So the, the very concept of these terrorist groups who have been able to, uh, to, to acquire these weaponry during the 60s and the 70s uh, was very much in, in, the, in everyone's minds. But when it came to actually people being able to carry out terrorist attacks, just regular everyday people, it was almost impossible for them to acquire the means for this. So the, there have been many studies trying to determine exactly why the military did what they did. Uh, generally, the, the historical consensus agrees that it's mostly because they were fascists. And fascists, there is a point in which fascism doesn't actually have uh, any reason for what they do. They may stand behind this military doctrine, for example, uh, or, or uh, Nazi ideology in, in Sean's case. But at the end of the day, these states were just acting out of, of uh, just fascism <laughs> and intolerance in general. Well, thank you all. I, I do appreciate that one theme among your papers is that this vilification of various groups that we see, um, I think you all pointed to that doesn't or has not necessarily ended, right? And that it, it lasted beyond the often nominal end of discrimination or the legal end or uh, beyond this period of extreme persecution, but that, that the othering continues and that the mindsets of, of othering and, and the cultural separation and, and uh, mindsets that continue, uh, the ability for those persecutions to happen continue. And so it, uh, I would just like to stress that we do need to note them recognize them and combat them and address them um, as the three of you have done. So I, I truly appreciate all of your papers in that regard. And so um, now each of you will have uh, a couple minutes to give some summative thoughts about uh, your own uh, paper, about what you uh, saw in others, how those uh, work together. Uh, we are going to begin with Sean. In terms of addressing the historiography, my presentation is foremost a way of parsing Joskowitz's epistemological concerns on the invocation of the history of the Roma genocide in Jewish Holocaust archives. Joskowitz explains that these Roma histories are thus imbued with a set of institutional and memorial presuppositions, and that Jewish perceptions of Roma in focal circumstances such as Auschwitz-Birkenau and the Logan Warsaw ghettos demonstrate not only shared persecution, but also variable power dynamics between them based on the Nazis' desire to divide oppressed groups and stifle potential solidarity. Although my presentation does not directly draw on Roma testimonies or address Joskowitz's echo of Trio's sense of layered archival silences, it does widen the parameters in which Roma-Jewish interactions are discussed. 
What I've sought to do is to excavate glimmers of Roma representation in these lucid Holocaust memoirs to address not only Jewish recollection of pivotal episodes of the Roma Holocaust, such as August 2nd, 1944 in Birkenau, but also the longer term patterns of interaction between these groups and with majority populations earlier on in Hungary, the first Czechoslovak Republic, and Southern Maramu Russia of Romania. Through these memoirs, I've noted economic symbiosis and cordiality between Jews and Roma in some cases, and distance between the two groups as well. In conveying the text of a detailed Holocaust memoir, that is uh, um, Albert Holmes, my handwriting saved me here. So uh, in, in doing so, I have also remarked that minority or minoritized populations, such as Carpathian Ruthenians and Czech administered Subcarpathian Ruthenia, were more understanding of dilemmas that Roma faced and interested in their way of life out of genuine curiosity rather than biopolitical paranoia. The prevalence of surveillance against Roma beginning in the interwar era, even in the comparatively democratic First Czechoslovak Republic, speaks to the intensity of suspicions against the Roma and constitutes a thematic parallel with the other two papers. Thank you all. I think that personally, my paper is a very, um, well, it's a, it's a very subjective thing to choose. Like Brian said in, the, in, his, in his introduction of me, I don't actually study political or military history of Argentina. I'm, I'm an ethnomusicologist. But my grandfather died last year after 70 years of union activism. And when we started preparing for this conference and we decided that we were going to be going with deleted histories, uh, the disappeared are called the disappeared for a reason. During the during the, the first military juntas period in the dictatorship, Jorge Rafael Videla, the, the main dictator, was interviewed about these people. And he said uh, that the disappeared don't exist. They're neither alive nor dead. They are disappeared. That's why we call them that, because that's the name they actually gave them. Uh, we retook that name. We reappropriated that name to show that they aren't actually disappeared. The only thing that, that's gone are their bodies. We don't know where they are, but they exist in our memory, in our collective memory. They are very much present all the time. And I think that I've, I've had a very interesting time in this particular panel. So I wanna thank Kelly and Shen because it's been a beautiful experience uh, talking with you about these situations, about and finding out this, the, the many similarities that can be traced between papers that deal with very different uh, time periods, very different cultures, very different countries, um, in which this violence and these narratives of violence were written under the, the pen of intolerance. And today we've been doing our very best, at least that's what I personally believe, to rewrite these narratives from a different perspective, from the perspective of diversity, the perspective of inclusion, and specifically the perspective of remembrance. So I wanna thank you again. I wanna thank Ryan and Joe, our producer, and everyone and all of colleagues at uh, the HDSC um, committee, organizing committee. And to finish, I just wanna acknowledge the land I'm currently located at, which is the land of my ancestral tribes, the Aoniken and the Gununakune. So thank you very much again, everyone. It's been a pleasure. I'd like to say that I recognize how uncomfortable these topics can be, um, especially when children and other vulnerable populations are, are the subject, um, as we all touched upon today in our respective papers. Um, but that doesn't mean that they should not be discussed. In fact, I think that when we omit the, these stories simply because of the discomfort and shame that they may engender. Not only do we do a disservice to our field, but we also do an injustice to the victims by failing to acknowledge who they were and what they went through, um, whether willingly or unwillingly. So I hope that these conversations continue. I'm glad we all had the opportunity to use this platform to be a part of those discussions together today. Um, so I wanna thank everyone Sean, Morgan, Ryan, Joanna, um, for helping us make this um, conference a possibility, allowing us the uh, platform to talk about these people's stories, talk about our papers. Um, and I'm excited for what our viewers, um, you know, contribute to these conversations. Thank you. On behalf of Ask Historians, I'd like to thank uh, each of you for your presentations.
for your comments and for your thoughts today, for your preparation and hard work. To all those of you who are viewing this, thank you very much for being here. I do hope that you will join our presenters in the question and answers, that you will ask them questions. I know that they're looking forward to responding to you. Um, so thank you all. And I, I hope that what was said today uh, will help all of us, uh, will help you understand the world a little bit better, understand how uh, violence is perpetrated so that we can uh, combat it and, and to take care of and protect the people, uh, all the people around us.